Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for having me back uh, to Migraine Canada. I really enjoy doing these talks for people. You know, I've had a lot of patients actually get referred to my clinic and talk about how they learned about their migraines through the webinars and things first. And so I think it's a really great tool to raise more awareness about migraine, and I, I hope you find it helpful. Uh, this topic is one by popular demand. Um, I get these questions a lot in my clinical practice uh, about different types of alternative treatments that people will often pursue for migraine and what really is the evidence behind them and what do I think of them as a neurologist. Um, so I wanted to kind of put together a smattering of topics. This is kind of a fun pop culture history trips. And uh, so we're going to talk about some interesting factoids out of ancient history, you know, other theories that people have had about migraine through the ages and from different cultures. And then we're gonna kind of take that into modern day. People are trying to use things like essential oils, which have a lot of basis in some ancient medicines uh, for using headache treatment today. And so, you know, what kind of quality of evidence do we have for that? Um, we'll also kind of take a quick look at things like topical treatments. So some of you may have already had experience with a compounding pharmacist who can make different preparations for you. And what kind of role do these have in people with specific types of headaches? So uh, this is just a quick bio on me. I'm a neurologist at the Royal College here in Canada, uh, also a headache medicine specialist and a member of the Canadian Headache Society. My clinic is in London, Ontario, uh, and we have quite a busy practice focused mostly on migraine, uh, but also other types of rare headache subtypes and unusual headaches. And my research looks at things like cannabinoid and psilocybin use for headaches. Uh, I'm doing a project on residency education and curricular content for headache because you know, if we're going to tackle this problem that affects so many people, we need the doctors to do it. Uh, and just as a caveat, I think it's relevant to this one. I did some uh, a program through Stanford University where we, we did an exchange and went to China for a summer uh, to learn about various alternative types of medicine and how it could be integrated with family medicine. And so I think it's important to keep an open mind, you know, when you're thinking about other cultural traditions and different types of medicine, you know, some of these have been going for thousands of years. And so, uh, you know, to just dismiss it in hand and, and say that you're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, I think is a mistake. Um, but, you know, coming from the Western scientific tradition, I'm a skeptic always, and I demand a certain level of evidence if I'm going to recommend something for my patients. So uh, we'll, we'll give you some hot takes on that. Uh, in disclosure, uh, so I did my fellowship with Canadian Headache Society, so it's funded through them, and I've had some research grants from some pharma companies to help with our residency curricular uh, exploration. I also take part in a lot of advisory boards for companies where we look at all the data as it comes out on these new medicines. So doctors will get together to talk about where we think these new drugs fit into the, the treatment landscape and, and how we can best use them or, or advocate for our patients to use them. And uh, I also give lots of talks like this, uh, whether it's for patient groups, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, um, trying to spread some more information about migraine. Um, and so with that, we'll turn to our objective. Uh, like I mentioned, what I wanna go over briefly with you tonight is uh, an introduction to the history of migraine and headache treatments. And this is by no means exhaustive. Like you could take an entire you know, undergraduate course in studying history of, of headache and, and medicine. And of course, we won't be able to go through every possible uh, folk medicine or different culture, but I wanted to highlight some of the greatest anecdotes that, that you know, headache doctors like to exchange. Then we're going to go into the oils, and I gave a little short list of some that are most commonly used for migraine. And like I mentioned, we're going to talk about the topicals with a focus on things like amitriptyline, lidocaine, capsaicin, and, and how can you use them. So on to our trip through history. We're going to start with trepanation, which, you know, many of you will probably have heard about, and it's kind of horrific and, and fascinating at the same time. And the word trepanation comes from the Greek trepanon, which means a borer, like dr drilling a hole. And the earliest skulls that we have found, we've dated to about 10,000 uh, BC, uh, and they come from North Africa. But these kind of skulls, and even in healed states have been found all over the world, in Asia, South America, Europe, across the, the board. Uh, so it seems like this was a common procedure. And just in folklore, you know, like modern common popular culture, it's often suggested that this was a treatment for headache. But there isn't actually a lot of evidence for that. Like the, the first writings that we have about this come from the 17th century, and he's a famous uh, physician who wrote a very famous medical textbook called William Harvey, and he suggested that it was likely for migraine. You know, that migraines are so terrible, of course, anyone would want to cut their head open to try to get the demons out. 
But, you know, we think that at least there is some good writing and evidence to suggest that it was used for things like epilepsy, uh, dystonias or weird stiffness and, and certain types of mental illness. Um, and so, you know, it's a fascinating uh, kind of procedure that existed across many different cultures. Um, and, you know, it kind of makes sense if you think it's a problem with the head and you got this pain that you can't get rid of, you'll do anything to take it out. Um, luckily, we do not do this anymore for migraine. Uh, then we're on to Egypt and Samaria. So this is about 2500 BCE. And we are lucky enough to have a few surviving copies of incredible papyri that uh, detail different surgical procedures, uh, a number of different potions and incantations and things. And it's not all magical thinking. Like some of these are incredible lists of different plants and uh, things that are ground and treated into pharmaceuticals and used for various conditions. And uh, this Ebers papyrus, named after the guy who picked it up, uh, it describes sick headaches. Uh, and so the Egyptians would take linen and it's, it's kind of uh, written on with magical prayers and names of, of some of their healing gods. And then they would take a clay crocodile stuffed with herbs in the mouth. And then they would tie the crocodile to your head and tie it really tight. And, you know, that may seem kind of crazy by today's standards. But if you think about it, you know, they're onto something empirically by discovering external compression, you know. And so it's, we have a lot of patients that massage their temples when they have a bad headache or they tie a tight cord or a tourniquet around their head because they're affecting all those nerves, the supratrochlear, the supraorbital, auricular temporal, occipital. They're going around the head and activating these nerves, kind of like a, a, little, a little bit of a lazy nerve block, you know. And so I think there's probably something to it. Uh, the crocodile was probably just for show, maybe a boost of placebo or something. Um, then we're on to the Greeks. So, you know, Hippocrates is probably one of the most famous doctors. Everybody has heard of the Hippocratic Oath, you know, but, you know, doctors actually these days don't even have to swear it. And there's a good reason for it, because if you actually look at what's written in there, it's kind of crazy. Um, and it really doesn't apply to the care that we provide today. In fact, uh, some of those things would go against what is considered normal. Um, so, you know, he is considered the father of modern medicine, and his textbooks were studied for centuries. Um, and, you know, there's some good stuff in there, but there's also a lot of mythology and things that we've abandoned, you know, thinking about the body in terms of humors and, and things like that. Um, in his writings, though, he is one of the first to record things about headache and migraine in particular. And he documented a severe type of headache that would commonly occur on only half the head or behind one of the eyes. And he observed that vomiting uh, would improve the nausea that was associated with this type of headache. And I think a, a big chunk of my patients often say, you know, after I actually bring up, I feel a lot better with the migraine. Perhaps that's some kind of, you know, Valsalva maneuver, raising the pressure in the abdomen that, that activates the vagus nerve or something to stop it. You know, uh, he was the first one to describe visual symptoms with, with headaches that, that typically preceded the attack. And in his writings, he talks about a shining light, usually in the right eye, which I guess that's specific to one kind of patient, followed by violent pain beginning in the temples and eventually reaching the whole head and the neck. And, uh, you know, a lot of people come to me talking about cervicogenic headaches, you know, and that's actually pretty controversial because I haven't found many true cervicogenic headaches. And we think of the trigeminal complex as a highway that kind of goes both ways. And uh, so migraine people often have neck pain and it's bleeding down through that cervicogenic complex into the upper cervical region and causing that stiffness. So he was already seeing the same thing, you know, I see every day in my clinic uh, and documenting it. Uh, a little bit later, we fast forward to the future in ancient Rome. And we have two very famous uh, physicians here that commented on headaches and, and tried to make sense of them. Uh, Aristeus, and this is kind of a very nice idealized statue of him. Uh, and also Galen, another very famous, uh, you know, father of medicine whose, whose surgical books and anatomy books were, were studied for a long time. And Aristeus described many kinds of migraine and parsed them into some of the variants that we still talk about today. Uh, and so there were shorter lasting attacks, there were longer duration attacks, multiple days, there was chronic migraine where it was happening quite frequently. And he gave migraine its first name, which was heterocrania. And then we move on to Galen a few years later, and he describes them as attacks uh, specifically, and used the term hemicrania to say half of a head. So hemi is half and cranium is your skull. And so as we, you know, rewrite the textbooks and everyone's language evolves, you know, through the world, 
eventually into the Middle Ages, Hemicrania becomes Megrim. So if you look at Micran to Megrim, and Megrim eventually becomes Migraine. And, you know, I think for like French or Spanish speakers, it's more apparent the etymology of this because you like think of migraine or migraña, you're like hemigraña, you know, so it kind of makes sense. Um, so that's the origin of the migraine term. An interesting little pause in the Middle Ages, and this is one of my favorites, uh, is Hildegard uh, von Bingen. And she's a fascinating, fascinating woman, very ahead of her time. She was an abbotess in Germany. Uh, so the head of a, a cloister of nuns, but her studies were focused on music and art and medicine. She made incredible illuminated texts of various herbs and remedies for medicine and was searching the ancient uh, books for various medical solutions. And what's fascinating is that scholars today, looking back at her illuminations, the, the kind of beautiful pictures that come along with the calligraphy, uh, they suspect that a lot of the visions that she claimed she was having from God were in fact migraine aura. And she credits these images with helping her to compose beautiful, beautiful music and to draw art like this. And she believed she was seeing windows into you know, the, the sacred city in heaven. Uh, but in fact, perhaps she was seeing scintillating scotomas and, and uh, migraine auras. So if you look at her pictures here, uh, you know, the bottom left and the top right, you can see the fortification spectra. So when we think of the classic migraine aura, which is the tychopsia, um, it's, it's named after the kind of walls you would see on an old castle where there's kind of little holes for people to shoot a bow and arrow through. And so she is perhaps interpreting some of her visual symptoms as, as the kind of walls of a city. And many patients will describe that kind of crescent-like C-shape Things starting in their vision and it spreads and evolves it's zigzag lines or, or blocks or cubes and it varies a lot between people uh, she also saw lots of stars and sparkles and things like this um, and so it's, it's just very fascinating to think that you know migraine is something that has been with us you know for as long as we've been recording history if you want to learn more about her i would really recommend it uh, there's a really excellent um, movie in German, Aus dem Lieben der Hildegard von Bingen. I think it's Vision or something in English, but it's um, it's an excellent movie, uh, and you know it's a really great uh, view into a very different time. Um, so I would I would recommend you check into that. Now, of course, we're not going to be able to stop by through every uh, cultural tradition of medicine, but I do want to highlight a few because so far we've been focused on the Western medical story. Um, of course, uh, there are ancient medicines from Persia and China that date back uh, many thousands of years as well. And one that I wanted to uh, touch on was acupuncture, because this is something that many, many of my patients pursue. Um, and, you know, it's not just one point. I'm just showing one here for you, Hagu, which I think is, is, you know, a commonly used acupoint that you don't even need to put needles that people often use. And practitioners of acupuncture will tell you that, you know, there are a lot of different uses of this, including toothache, dizziness, hemorrhoids, headache, asthma, blood pressure, and anxiety. And I think that's kind of casting the net a little bit wide. Um, but, you know, it seems to be commonly recommended for headache. And I have some patients that tell me that they like it. And I think, you know, it doesn't seem to hurt. And I don't think it has many side effects. So that's fine by my books. Um, what's interesting is that um, acupuncture, I studied it a little bit when I was in China, I, I think it has a lot of benefit, and the people that practice it will say it does, but it's not sustained, and so perhaps maximum you're going to get two weeks of benefit, and you need to continue to repeat it, and there are lots of things that we do that are not, you know, a permanent fix or don't change you forever, like Botox or even the CGRP antibodies, they require repeat dosing to continue to benefit you. Um, so it's just something to take into account when you're calculating if the risks and benefits of a treatment. There were some small studies. Uh, the trouble with a lot of the literature we have on acupuncture is that these aren't large, uh, you know, huge cohorts. Uh, there are a few studies that tried to meta-analyze acupuncture for lots of conditions and lump them all together, but there's a lot of methodologic issues with those studies. This one was a pretty uh, good study uh, done, conducted in Germany across a variety of centers, I think 18 centers. And it included 302 patients with migraine, uh, but it didn't exactly, you know, make a differentiation between episodic and chronic the way we might in a more rigorous study and things like that. Um, they did the typical points, which aren't just hugu, but they do some in the head and some in the back and stuff. And um, what they found was that the people who did the typical meridians, you know, so if you look at that diagram on the left, 
there's this idea that there are lines or channels of energy through our body and that there are specific points in particular muscles and, and locations that correspond to nodes on these meridians and that there might be an obstruction or you need to adjust the flow of energy through them. Um, interestingly enough, the comparison of this with sham needling and what a sham needle means is that you don't necessarily follow the accurate meridians of, of this kind of ancient idea and you just put needles in the local area. Um, when we compare sham needling and the traditional meridians, the effect is comparable. So there, it, there's no significant difference there, but both sham needling and the, the meridian style acupuncture were both superior to placebo. So I think the takeaway from this is that, you know, there is some good evidence that it works, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to follow the ancient idea and the reasoning behind it. Uh, sham needling, the effect of actually just placing a needle in the local area seems to be uh, similarly effective. So I want to take a little moment just to pause and kind of give a brief overview of, this is very rudimentary of, of the theory of Chinese medicine, some elemental imbalance. So a lot of it works on this idea of five elemental groups. So you've got wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And each of these, you know, even very similar to our own indigenous medicine, we all include things like seasons, direction, climate, stage of growth and development, internal organs, body tissue. Uh, so the categories are, you know, seemingly limitless. Um, from a TCM perspective, though, migraine is thought to be due to like an invasion of wind and fire. And then it causes meridian obstructions, and then it disturbs the flow of blood, which you know is usually referred to as qi, but that has lots of different translations. Qi can mean blood, but it can mean energy and other things like that. Um, and so this is thought to, to cause migraines. The idea behind the TCM concept of treatment is to calm the liver, get rid of pathogens, unblock the meridians, uh, you know, and, and there's this idea of disharmony between the elements and you have to specifically target it with certain foods or, or poultices or tinctures or acupuncture. Um, and, you know, this may seem very foreign to people in a Western context. And when I was in China, I had some very fantastic professors who practice both, you know, and they see the cultural value and as a framework for people for understanding it. And they gave me this analogy that I thought really hit it on the nose. They said, you know, imagine you have an old cathode ray television and the image goes fuzzy, you got some static. They said, well, a Western doctor, what would they do? They would take apart the whole TV, look at each little piece, figure out what each little piece does, repair it, and then put it back together and fix your TV. But he said, you know, Chinese doctors over many thousands of years, we've learned exactly where to hit the TV and where it's most likely to help you to hit the TV and fix the image. And so I think the basis of that is that our two traditions of medicine are very different. There's like inductive and deductive reasoning. There's kind of empiricism where we just kind of collect observations. And don't get me wrong, like we have that in migraine as well. Well, you know, like a lot of our theories of migraine that we relied on to explain our medicines before are actually were proven to not be correct. And we had, we found a different explanation. I, I think the trick is that you have to be willing to change your opinion and your theories when new evidence arises to the contrary. Like, I, I don't believe any idea can rest on its laurels. Um, but, you know, so an important point, for instance, is like, there wasn't a lot of dissection that occurred in, in Chinese medicine throughout critical periods of, of these ancient texts being written. You know, it was forbidden. And so people often relied on going to battlefields to look at a liver or something. And as a result, there are some kind of inferences about certain types of organs that unfortunately mean that there are organs that don't actually exist. Like something called the triple burner with kind of like a tripartite kind of metabolism idea, uh, but doesn't actually correspond to any organ in the body. Um, so, so it's very interesting. Um, but that being said, it's been practiced for thousands of years and fine-tuned by many caring people practicing to help people. And obviously, they've discovered some incredible uh, ways to help and treat diseases. Uh, we just need to work on demonstrating the efficacy in a rigorous way and, and, and finding ways to incorporate it in our practices. Uh, now, slipping over to Persia. Uh, so there's a famous, famous uh, Dr. Avicenna. Um, who has given us a lot of different ideas about migraine, in particular, this kind of hot and cold phenotypes of migraine. And again, this kind of goes to a, a type of humoral theory of, of disease, that there are imbalances of temperatures or liquids in your body. Um, and what he had recommended was uh, rose oil 
uh, from Damascena uh, as a tonic for, for brain issues and disorders, even mental illnesses, but they would prepare it in a very particular way with sesame oil. And uh, so he, I, I guess, his, Excuse me. Um, so there, he had many medicinal plants that he purported thought could be useful for, for Persian medicine. And so a lot of the evidence when I did a review uh, of essential oils actually comes from modern day Iran, where they're studying some of these uh, ideas that come from classical medicine, their tradition, uh, to see if they have any usefulness for people today. And so we're going to go through them kind of one by one. Um, and, you know, I think in our modern conception of Western medicine, there's a lot of ideas about these plant extracts uh, that contain certain things like terpenes and flavonoids, molecules that are able to exert a, a strong pharmacologic effect. And some of them that are recommended are shown to have anti-inflammatory properties. So like reducing nitrous oxide, you know, COX-2 inhibitors, which are like some of the NSAIDs that you may use for your migraines. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's very interesting to look at some of these old plants. Um, you may recall aspirin, for instance, uh, you know, and that that originally is thought to have or stemmed from some observations about uh, willow bark. Um, and various cultures have used this over the millennia. Uh, you know, in Egypt and Sumeria, it was documented as being used. Um, and then uh, our own indigenous people here in North America had been making tea from willow bark. Uh, and but it wasn't until it was observed later. Uh, eventually perfected in Germany and chemically modified that we were able to make the potent version of it, which is aspirin today. Um, and I think aspirin kind of fell out of favor uh, for a number of reasons, um, but it's still a very useful treatment for migraine for some people. So what can history teach us about migraine and its treatment? Number one, obviously migraine is severe and disabling illness. We all know people and loved ones who have carried this burden and it has changed the course of their life for some of them. And it has been affecting humanity even in prehistoric times, uh, you know, and we can see that from the trepanation. People will exhort, uh, resort to extreme measures like drilling holes into their head to do anything to relieve themselves from migraine. And that speaks to how severe this kind of problem can be. I think we've made some great progress, especially in the last century. Uh, but obviously, we still do not understand everything about migraine and its genesis. And that's why I think it's so important to keep an open but skeptical mind. You know, everything I still think has to go through the grinder to prove is true. And, uh, and keep an open mind to new potential treatments and avenues. One thing I want to highlight for you is that migraine is a clinical diagnosis, which means, you know, we ask you a bunch of questions in that consult, and we have some agreed upon criteria that satisfy that uh, for, for research purposes, essentially, that allows us to talk about a particular set of people with a particular set of symptoms as a group and what can we do to treat them. But you know, if you are familiar with our ICHD3 criteria, that international classification of headache disorders, if you read migraine, sure, it tells you the nausea and vomiting, light and sound, uh, you know, throbbing, severe, unilateral usually. Um, but if you were to come to my clinic and watch 100 patients with frequency up to like 80 or 90%, there are other things like visual blurring, brain fog, neck pain, vertigo, tinnitus, and mental health conditions like anxiety disorders and, and depression and things that are so comorbid. And I, I do not believe migraine is caused by mental health issues, but they travel along and they're comorbid problems that feed each other. And, you know, I think we need to also expand the way that we think about this problem because many of those other symptoms get ignored or minimized. Um, so as it's a clinical diagnosis, the problem is that we don't have good imaging. Like an MRI is not gonna find much except for nonspecific white matter lesions, which you should not be too worried about. Um, as well as, you know, we don't have a great blood test. Sometimes in clinical trials, you'll read about them measuring CGRP levels, but this is not a prime time kind of thing. You know, you have to be carried on ice and tested immediately, and it's just really a, a really unstable kind of test. So I think that's the holy grail for us is to find a way to quantify migraine and measure it over time and see that you're improving so that we can better track it. The path forward for developing new treatments, it has to require careful observation, you know, so really thinking about the definitions we use, being very careful about how we record outcomes for patients, uh, thinking of new ideas, different pathways that are involved, and of course, rigorous testing and proof. 
you know, there's that famous quote from a Harvard philosopher, uh, Dr. Santayana, you know, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So with that, I want to turn our ideas to looking at how can we uh, perhaps incorporate some of these ancient things into to modern medicine. So essential oils, do they really work for migraines? I have many patients that use them, some patients that sell them, you know, and some people are making their own. Uh, and I think it's an interesting, uh, an interesting way forward. Uh, not all of them, I think, are as good as some people purport, but there are a few that are very interesting to me that I think may, may be useful. So the ones that are commonly used would be things like lavender oil, uh, rose oil, chamomile, peppermint, and eucalyptus. So how to use them? Uh, people use them in different ways. You can apply them to your temples. Uh, you can dilute them often with another carrier oil like coconut or something. They massage them into their temples, their head, their scalp, the back of the head, the neck. Um, and, you know, I remember we often had uh, uh, nurses on my stroke ward who would use uh, oregano oils and, and mint and everything. And we come in and it smelled so fresh and <laughs> nice. And anyway, it was, a, it was a running joke about the, the stroke ward causing all the migraines. But uh, you can also inhale it. So some people put it on a tissue and hold it under the nose to breathe deeply. Um, you know, I remember when we were working on gastroenterology, we used to put a little bit of mint oil under our mask on the filtrum there and, and it would uh, keep it nice and fresh. And uh, you can also use a compress. You can soak a towel in cold water, add a few drops. You can apply it to your forehead or neck. Some people use diffusers like you can see in the picture here. You can pick them up. They're pretty common now and they're not too expensive. Um, and you know it's, it's a good kind of spa-like atmosphere in your bathroom. Um, other people will add them directly to the bath and you get a nice aromatherapy. So lavender, this is the first one. And uh, again, like I mentioned, a lot of these studies are coming out of uh, Iran, modern day Iran. And looking at the specific components of it, there's uh, linalool, so linalool and uh, linalool acetate. And people have purported a lot of things about this that you know it can be anxiolytic, uh, you know, reducing your stress or anxiety. It can have local anesthetic properties, which I'm not too convinced about. Uh, and that some have recommended in ancient medicine as an anti-epileptic, uh, which I would not recommend because we have very good drugs that work wonderfully. Um, and, you know, I would not say that uh, it has particular antineoplastic properties, although it has been studied for this and there isn't a lot of good evidence, but, but you'll see that. Um, in terms of lavender, this study looked at it as an oral prophylactic therapy. And so they wanted to mix it into a, a cup of water and see, see how it works for migraine. And so I, I recorded here kind of how they're, they're parsing it and diluting it. And they want to follow up in three months. And the primary outcome was looking at their MIDAS scores. So if you've been to a migraine clinic, you've probably done the MIDAS, uh, which you know is probably very difficult to interpret and varies between patients. And uh, they're comparing at three months of, after taking this uh, compared to uh, baseline. And they looked at other things like uh, headache days and the severity of the headaches. So the one thing that I thought was kind of a confounding factor of this was that every participant who took this therapy was also previously started on propranolol. Uh, and it doesn't say exactly when they started the propranolol. Um, and then they received the lavender extract as an adjunct. Um, which, you know, ideally you're not adding two variables at once. And propranolol also has very good demonstrated evidence for migraines. So unfortunately, we call that a confounder when you're, when you're mixing two variables. Uh, which was one thing that was nice, though, is that it doesn't seem to have side effects. Um, this is just a quick overview of how they parsed the study. So, you know, 30 patients were essentially cleared to participate, and they divided them in half um, for placebo. It didn't exactly mention how they created the placebo because lavender is very potent, as you may know. <coughs> and so it would be pretty hard to mask that uh, unless perhaps it's just around the cup or something and they're smelling it, but it's not in the actual solution that they're drinking. Uh, but it does tend to have a characteristic taste as well. Um, the demographics that were involved, uh, pretty well balanced between the case and control groups, uh, and there weren't really any problems seen there. And let's get to the results here. Um, so we were comparing the number of headache days at baseline, uh, the first month and the third month. And as you can see, uh, both in the control group and the case group, uh, so the control group is the placebo, both see some reductions over time. And you know this is common that we see across all migraine trials. There's a very strong placebo response for a lot of our treatments. Um, but you know we want to be able to demonstrate that our intervention is better than that significantly. So it does seem to fall off in the, the case group. 
Um, and the other, you know, perhaps getting rid of the confounding effect is that, uh, you know, the the control group is also taking propranolol. So perhaps this is an additive, uh, an additive effect uh, with some synergy there. So it seems very promising that they're falling off over time, but we have to take into account this is a very small sample size of only 60 patients, and the propranolol does still confound the results. So I, I'm not quite ready to recommend this, but it, it definitely deserves some additional study, I think. Um, old is new again. Okay, so building on what Avicenna was talking about, the rose oil. So this was kind of the one that they were most excited to investigate um, based on Avicenna's theory. And so this was a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial of rose oil, and they're using it not as a preventive, but as an acute abortive. So for when you have the migraine, you want to get rid of it. They took 40 patients, again, a small sample size, but, you know, a pilot study. And they were randomly assigned to treatment versus placebo. One wrinkle here is that they differentiated not on the basis of the frequency of the migraine, as we might have preferred, uh, chronic versus episodic. But instead, they used this kind of idea of a hot and cold migraine, which borrows from that kind of ancient classification of the headache. And I'll show you on the next slide what that means. Um, so the first two consecutive migraine attacks were treated with um, either the topical rose oil or a placebo, which kind of smells the same. And they used the ancient technique of macerating the rose petals in sesame oil. Um, the active ingredients that you would find in rose oil would be like citronella, so citron like lemon, and geraniol, which is geranium. And you know, once you get into the fantastic world of all these molecules that give you flavors and smells, you'll see that a lot of plants and even cannabis, all these things have overlapping uh, kind of properties that give all the plants their incredible smells. And uh, you know, one thing that I think is so fascinating, and I recommend all my patients, is forest bathing. Like, go out into the forest; it's wet and raining, and you're smelling all these incredible green things and stuff. And you know, it has also been shown to have anxiolytic properties. And I also think it's just good to go for a hike and and get your migraines under control. Um, so if you're able to, and you're able to get out to the forest, you know, this is one cheap way. You don't have to buy expensive essential oil. Um, so. After one week washout period, then they cross over. So those who are taking placebo go to the rose oil, and those who are taking the rose oil go to placebo. Um, and so they watch them again and, and watch to see if there's different uh, statistical probability of improvement. So the primary outcome is looking at intensity of the migraine at onset, and then they looked at 10 intervals all the way up to 24 hours. And then the secondary outcome was looking at, you know, what we now call the most bothersome symptom, light or sound sensitivity or nausea or vomiting. And again, like I mentioned, the data was then uh, analyzed after post hoc in terms of uh, looking at hot and cold type syndrome. So baseline characteristics, you know, this is pretty characteristic of what you would see in a migraine clinic from young people all the way to 65. Um, you know, they have headaches that are as brief as an hour or lasting over up to a day and, and having them quite frequent. Um, the other stuff is like uh, this hot temperament of headache, you know, perhaps 16 of them uh, had this hot temperament. Um, what we'll look through here is the mean pain intensity of patients migraine headache at different time points. And so we start at uh, zero minutes and we're looking at rose versus placebo. And it's, it's pretty high, it's up there, it's moderate, it's, it's six-ish. And over time as you go, you can see it dropping slowly and by the end at 24 hours, uh, we're 2.18 with the rose oil and 2.20 with the placebo. Uh, so, I mean, just off the bat, you think, well, that's not a huge difference. I mean, they're both seeming to naturally resolve. So maybe this is just the natural course of migraine. Uh, so looking now at the nausea and vomiting, uh, we also see similarly that, you know, there's not really statistically significant differences in the rates of nausea and vomiting or lighter sound sensitivity between the two groups. So at first pass, you're like, well, okay, maybe it's not so great. But then they decide to do this post hoc analysis and they say, okay, well, if we go back through the text and look through the ancient definitions and stick to this hot migraine, and hot migraine is the, the, defined by having eye redness, conjunctival injection, perhaps like a, they have some autonomic features, light sensitivity, pulsatility made worse by heat, and odor sensitivity to things like pepper and cardamom, uh, and having a hot sensation like flushing in, in, during the attack in the face. And if we look at those patients who satisfy, you know, at least three or more of those criteria, and then just look at that subgroup, uh, there does seem to be a significant difference between the hot and cold people in terms of who responds. 
Um, but you know, the issue is, um, and we're taught to do this in statistics, is you have to be very careful about subgroup analyses. Uh, you know, being careful to design your study from the get-go to be large enough to prove that a small subgroup uh, already has, uh, you know, a statistical difference. Because otherwise, you would see drug companies doing hundreds of tiny little subgroup analyses on everything. And if you throw a thousand darts, eventually, like one of them is going to be a bullseye. So. I think it's important, uh, you know, to make sure that your trials are designed in a robust way. So, you know, mean intensity of migraine, not significantly different from placebo. Associated symptoms, not significant between groups. Uh, but it does seem to be like, you know, perhaps in this hot subtype of thinking about migraine, that uh, it has more of an effect. And so I think that's the pearl for me taking from this was that it's important to always revisit our definitions of migraine clinically. You know, they're in flux. Even right now, you may hear that uh, we're re revisiting the idea of chronic versus episodic, and do we really need to think of it on that arbitrary 15-day cutoff? So I, I think for me, it's the spirit of inquiry and, and thinking that we need to constantly revisit our ideas and entertain perhaps some of these older ideas. They may have observed something useful that we're ignoring now. So there are issues with the study. Small sample sizes, ancient definitions, confounded by additives like sesame that perhaps have some other additives, so I can't say it's only rose. Uh, so unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, no roses for Avicenna. Um, next up, and I want to give you some good success stories too, is chamomile. Um, so they, they next turn their attentions to chamomile. And again, this stems back to traditional Persian medicine. Uh, they would often boil aqueous chamomile extract in sesame oil. And, you know, there are some plausible ideas about the mechanism of how this might work. Um, so there's certain chemicals in it that inhibit um, inducible nitrous oxide synthase, which you know makes a chemical that dilates blood vessels and, and improves uh, pain transmission and nerve endings. It activates them. Um, so it may have some sort of neuroprotective effect as well. Um, the flavonoids that are included in it have like strong inhibition of prostaglandins and a selective COX-2 inhibitor, so some similar properties to anti-inflammatories. Um, and the polyphenols in it also have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, so, you know, it's very interesting to think of as another kind of alternative treatment. So in this one, they took 100 patients, again, a double-blind crossover trial, placebo-controlled, um, and then each patient took two tubes of drug and two tubes of placebo during the study, but like the last one, they would cross over halfway. Um, and so the primary outcome, again, looking at pain intensity of the migraine over those intervals in the 24 hours, and then the secondary outcome was those other symptoms. So. Uh, demographic information of the crossover arms. Uh, we're looking, uh, again, uh, pretty comparable between the groups, like not a lot of significant differences, so I'm not concerned about that. I don't normally uh, include marriage status in my clinical trials. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea, this is more just for reference if you want to go back, but just showing you how the trial was divided in terms of the placebo arm and the allocated uh, to uh, treatment, and then that washover with the crossover. So this was an intention to treat population, which means um, you know, you're supposed to keep everybody that even if they fail to use the medicine properly, because perhaps it's capturing something that's difficult about it. Like if you had a really difficult applicator or something and then people just give up because they don't like using it, you couldn't only really include the patients that took the medicine properly unless you already announced that you're doing a subgroup analysis. So, you know, they initially described it as an intention to treat population, um, but then eventually did kind of per protocol, which means they were just studying uh, the people who applied it properly. Um, so when we look at that in a per protocol population, it was much improved. Um, so if you're able to adhere to the proper application to the forehead and temples and everything, you have a lot better chance of that being pain-free at uh, two hours, 30% uh, roughly. Um, and recurrence of headache of rebound, you know, at 24 hours um, seems to be much lower versus placebo, um, as well as sustained uh, pain relief up to 24 hours. Um, so, you know, this one actually, it seemed very promising and interesting, um, but again, uh, limited by kind of small sample sizes and, uh, you know, this per protocol analysis. Um, I won't spend too much time here, but basically the gist of it was just showing people that, you know, you also had reduction uh, of things like nausea, light, and sound sensitivity. 
So small sample sizes, they mixed kind of an intention to treat in a per protocol approach, which I think could be cleaned up in a repeat study. Um, and again, there's additives like sesame, but you know, this could just be part of the magic of how this medicine works and it needs to be multiple components. Um, but it would be very difficult to kind of make these traditional Persian preparations yourself, you know? So I think uh, access would be an issue, but, but this may be a cost-effective alternative if we can find a way to, to use it properly and study it. Um, onto eucalyptus and peppermint. These are probably way more commonly used here in North America. And uh, this is a great uh, paper looking at it from Kiel in Germany, um, published in Cephalgia. And uh, it was uh, looking at the topical application of eucalyptus and peppermint. And this seems to be very promising. Um, some of you may have heard of stop pain, probably more common in the States, um, but there's other things you can get here like the sage roller or things like that that in include some of these chemicals in it. Um, and this was another small study, a very tiny one, 32 patients enrolled, only 25 completed the study, um, but they would apply stop pain during an attack and see if it had any good effect. Um, and you know, it does seem to be useful. There was a significant improvement in headache intensity by two hours after the application. Um, but you know, for me, 25 patients is very small. Um, and if you really believe in it, I wanna see uh, some zeros after that. So uh, menthol and TRPM8. So what is TRPM8? It's a mouthful. It's a transient receptor potential action channel subfamily M, which stands for melastatin, uh, member number eight. Um, but basically, we study all these different protein channels that are in your nerve endings, and some of them respond to different stimuli. Some are for mechanical activation by pushing on your nerves. Some of them are activated by temperature. Some of them are activated by chemical things. And most receptors can be activated by everything if you reach a strong enough threshold. So this one in particular um, is, is thought to be the only temperature receptor that mediates a response to kind of moderate cold temperatures. And evolutionarily, like anthropologists and geneticists kind of think that this allowed for an adaptation or like a homeostatic response to cold temperatures. So, you know, humans have adapted to a variety of climates. Um, and so what's very fascinating about this, when they do large scale genetic studies across the globe, they're able to see that the, the variants in this gene vary by latitude. And so they think that the very original phenotype or phenocopy uh, allele of this gene is probably most prominent equatorially, especially in African countries. And then as you move out uh, further north and further south, you start to see uh, people that are more cold resistant and actually have this other type of gene and what's fascinating is that the original copy, the one that's prominent equatorially, is protective against migraine. Uh, and so perhaps, uh, you know, even developing uh, a susceptibility to migraine was the trade-off that we suffered for, for adapting to colder climes as populations drifted. Um, so it's very fascinating kind of paper. I invite you to look at this paper because if you can get your hands on it, it's a very interesting read. Um, so this receptor is expressed in pain and temperature sensitive neurons in the dorsal root ganglion. And so this is one of the little uh, nerve centers um, beside the spine that help to process sensory input. And uh, we think it has a role in pain perception of cold stimuli and also like uh, infl inflammatory conditions. So at uh, 15 to 30 degrees Celsius, it kind of lets these positively charged ions in through the hole, in through the door. Um, and the strength is inversely proportional to temperature. So as the temperature goes up, less goes through. And as the temperature goes down, more of these ions are going in. And if you know anything about uh, nerves, uh, pretty much the way they have that electrical impulse travel down is a constant change, a flux inward and outward of different uh, concentrations of ions, negative and positive charge things. Um, we won't get into that today because you'll fall asleep. And uh, so very, very interesting. And so this, uh, what's fascinating to me is that a receptor that's meant for temperature can also be activated chemically. And so when you apply menthol or eucalyptus, you get this cooling sensation, but it's not actually cold. You're just activating the same receptor and your brain is interpreting it as cold. You know, and cold is probably like, like wet, you know, it's like pressure and temperature and all these things that come together and, and your brain interprets it as a certain type of sensation. And you know we'll get into it in a second, but you see a similar thing with capsaicin, the chili pepper extract. It gives you a hot sensation. Um, 
So very interesting that this is potentially uh, protective against migraine. Um, so, so that's something to think about. Um, moving forward from this, because I think that's probably the most promising of the topical oils would be things like menthol and eucalyptus, um, is into like what other kinds of topical preparations are available for use in headache. Um, and so why on earth would you compound a medicine yourself? You know, it seems like a lot of effort and cost. Where do you get it? Why would you use it? Um, you know, it can be used for everything from migraine, cluster headache, trigeminal neuralgia, surgical site pain. Um, the other types of things people sometimes use is like intranasal lidocaine. I throw this in here as kind of an odd one, but you know, there's uh, the Dr. Maisel protocol and it, viscous lidocaine in a syringe in your nose, it gets into that uh, SPG, the sphenopalatine ganglion, and it helps to treat migraines. Um, you know, it's, it's quite safe and effective. Um, and then hot and cold, we're going to talk about kind of the difference between capsaicin and menthol's effects on pain processing. Um, so very interesting. What I'd say the pros and cons, you're going to get fewer systemic side effects because you're not absorbing as much into the bloodstream as acting mostly locally. Uh, rapid termination. More medication is applied at the area that is needed, you know, conceivably, which I, I think this is debatable because we think a lot of the migraine actually comes from the brainstem. But, you know, you're modulating peripherally, which I think is important. You avoid the first pass metabolism. What this means is when you eat a medicine, and it gets absorbed from your stomach, all that blood from the stomach first goes through the liver as a filter before it enters the general circulation. So the liver is going to remove some of it if it's hepatically metabolized before you even get in. So you're losing a chunk of what you ate. Um, this approach avoids that. It's also useful for people who don't want to take pills. Like I still have a lot of adult patients who are like, I could never swallow pills as a kid and I hate it. Like I just don't want to swallow anything. Um, and so this is a good option. Uh, some people have purported using this as an option in pregnancy. Um, personally, I would not probably recommend that, but um, some, some doctors have, have used it in that context. The other issue, though, is that they can be time, uh, you know, time drained to, to apply them multiple times per day. And then you got this goopy, oily mixture like in your scalp or something. So it may not be a day that you're going out uh, to work or something because this might you know, conceivably be better for a day where you're bed bound. So the applications can be messy or uncomfortable. Um, so topical terminology, uh, you got all these different types of things. Like it's almost dizzying. I think a lot of doctors even feel intimidated by compounding because there's too many options. You know, so you can have a solution, which is kind of a water-based or alcoholic lotion, uh, which isn't very oily at all. Lotion is thought to be thicker and it contains a little bit of oil in it, um, but you know, it's an emulsion. So you gotta shake it up to keep it like that. Uh, cream is even thicker yet, um, so a 50-50 emulsion, and you probably need to add some preservatives to extend it. Ointments now are getting like pretty greasy. They're usually 80% oil, and uh, you know you often don't actually need preservatives for this because the oil is keeping it prepared. And, and they'll often include other things like different waxes um, or oils, uh, depending on your pharmacist. Uh, gels are more of an aqueous or alcoholic type. It's a different thing based in cellulose, which is like a plant type of uh, carbohydrate. And usually, like you think of like hand sanitizer, but it's kind of like a gel, and it turns into liquid as you touch it. Um, paste is more concentrated and thicker. Uh, so you think of like a clay or something like that. So in terms of the thickness, uh, you know, thick skin absorbs more than, uh, or thin skin rather, absorbs more than thick, you know, so if you're applying to the face, you need less than if you're applying to your heels, you know, and the thickness varies with the body site, your age, as well as other skin conditions like psoriasis, eczema. And so we think of the skin, its primary purpose is a barrier to protect your body from the outside world. It also regulates temperature and a million other things, but um, in this context, it can be disrupted by things. So if you have scaly skin, ichthyosis, um, if you have keratolytic agents, so if you're using things like salicylic acid for warts or something, you know, you got to be careful about these medicines because they're going to get right in there. Um, and other things like inflammatory conditions and rashes can make it worse. Uh, lotion is probably greater absorption where there's occlusion, you know, which means you're going to hold more of that liquid in there. So a crease where you're going to hold the liquid for a longer time or under dressings, uh, the location. And then formulation, um, you know, it's it's probably greater when a greasy ointment formulation is used for penetration through the first layer of the skin. Uh, smaller molecules of medicine are easily absorbed through the skin compared to larger stuff, which just bounces back. And then lipophilic, what does this mean? So there's hydrophilic and lipophilic. Hydro is water, lipo is fat. 
and philia means to like something. So they like fat, that means they can get through the kind of thick area of the skin easily. If it's hydrophilic, it means it can kind of travel through water or aqueous layers a bit more efficiently. Um, and so ideally you want kind of a mixture of these things so that you can get to different layers and it depends what you're targeting. Um, and obviously the concentration of the medicine, you know, higher concentrations are more likely to get through the skin. Um, so, you know, even seemingly tiny differences in the formulation can actually make a big difference in how effective patients perceive them to be. Uh, just quickly to show you the skin anatomy, because we're going over a lot of this stuff uh, very briefly, but um, there's lots of layers to your skin, as you know, but the outer one is the stratum corneum, and it's got a lot of stuff called keratin in it. And keratin makes your skin waterproof and durable, um, you know, and so you really want to try to get past that first layer, and to do that, it's got to be a little bit lipophilic. But once you get into the kind of deeper layers, uh, there's aqueous layers of the skin that are more water-based. And so the fat, really hyper-fat soluble stuff isn't going to make it past that layer very well. So you kind of want to balance your properties. Um, so when to consider topical preparations? We already talked about the stop pain. Other things are like ketoprofen gel uh, or other topical things you may have tried like A535 or, or other things like that, uh, Voltaren. Um, we also think about it in some patients who are really refractory and have tried everything like cluster headache, a really excellent example is post-herpetic neuralgia. So if any of you have had uh, shingles or zoster and it's affecting part of your skin, an excellent, excellent remedy is, is to try one of these compounded creams with amitriptyline, capsaicin, uh, and, and maybe some other agents. But you should be seen at a pain clinic because it's one excellent way to treat this and it has a lot of good evidence behind it. Um, Trigeminal neuralgia, you know, like I see patients who are desperate enough to try, you know, Botoxing their face, you know, until they're paralyzed, like they've had a stroke or a Bell's palsy. And I think it's, it's probably better to try some of these topicals first, or maybe in the mouth even. Um, and, and other types of atypical facial pain, this might be one potential option. Uh, but it, it still is not very commonly used because most doctors don't, don't uh, feel comfortable using these topical preparations. So again, I think it's useful for side effect prone patients. You know, like a lot of people tell me, they're like, oh, you probably never met anyone like me. You know, I'm sensitive to every single medicine and, and I have side effects to everything. But that's actually pretty common that people feel a lot of side effects. So this might be one way, you know, to pick a medicine that's not really systemically absorbed and interacting with your system to the same extent. Um, you know, Botox is a great option for that. Um, the monoclonal antibodies for migraine are, are generally very well tolerated, but are still systemic. And again, the pill phobic people. Uh, so let's get started just very quickly. Uh, if you want to get started with this, find a compounding pharmacist first, okay, before you go to your family doctor or something. And, you know, just a historical vignette since we're on the topic, compounding was the routine, okay, before pharma standardized all of these pills, uh, which is a good quality control measure. Um, you used to go to all your different pharmacists and they would make up whatever your doctor wrote on this prescription. Um, so a lot of the things that you were making, even in one pill, were many things combined. Um, and so search your internet, find a good compounding pharmacist, make sure they're reputable and they've got all their qualifications. And then uh, call them or make an appointment to discuss what you like and what they can do. And then they'll often even give you a copy of their prescription patch for compounding that you can take to the family doctor. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about this, not that you'll necessarily be prescribing, but just so you're aware of the process, you got to pick a base like we talked about. Is it a gel uh, or, or some other type of uh, cream or lotion? And then you're going to pick the ingredients. Um, so, you know, the basic ones would be things like anesthetics, sodium channel blockers. Is it lidocaine or benzocaine? You know, you've all had uh, probably dental procedure that numbs you. Uh, capsaicin, which is the chili pepper extract. Um, and an interesting point about that is that it burns. Okay, like they even sell lip balm to make your lips beautiful and full that it just like swells up your lips from capsaicin. So not great for areas with mucous membranes, like you're not going to put it in eyes or mouth really in mucosa or in genital area or anything, you have to be very careful. Um, and so I have used it very judiciously on people on scars, like from post incisional neuropathic pain from neurosurgeries and stuff. But I warn them, I'm like, you have to be so careful and wash your hands so thoroughly because if you let it even drip sweat into your eye, it's going to swell shut and you're going to really feel it. Um, so not the greatest choice for that, but, you know, an act of desperation. Um, other things you can put in are the anticonvulsants, gabapentin, phenytoin. 
ketoprofen, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory. And sometimes we use alpha-2 adrenergic agonist clonidine for pain, uh, and of course, ketamine and amitriptyline. So this here is like not for memorization, obviously, but just to show you the broad breadth of what can possibly be included in uh, compounding. But you know, not every pharmacist has access to all of this, but they'll often be able to order things in for you if you if you want to include it. Um, I put a little few pros on the side for reference that you know, like for those worried about cost, baclofen is cheaper than you know other muscle relaxant like cyclobenzaprine. Um, like some of them, like the pharmacist gets really irritated when you ask them to make it, like diclofenac, if it's too uh, not concentrated enough, it's actually very viscous, which means it's thick and gooey and it's very hard for them to make it properly. Um, and some of them like ketoprofen, you know, maybe it's gonna irritate the skin less than if you use diclofenac. So these are just all the little nuances that you pick up after, you know, making these a couple of times. And uh, some of them work better together, like if you combine amitriptyline and ketamine. Um, so very, very interesting and uh, I think a, a neat way to help patients. Um, so this is a series of different sample combinations, um, but, you know, I would say uh, always consult with your provider and see what they recommend. Um, for peripheral or nociceptive symptoms, like we're talking hyperalgesia, things hurt more than they should. Allodynia, which means things that shouldn't hurt, hurt, like touching your hair or combing it. Um, peripheral neuropathy or, or, you know, other types of pain, including headache. Uh, you can start with something like this for some people. Um, and we tend to like increase it very gradually. You know, it's a trial and error process. Always start low, go slow. You can adjust it uh, time after time. And sometimes we sub out ingredients if we don't think they're working. Um, but, you know, a good place to go if your family doctor doesn't feel comfortable with this is ask for a referral to your local pain service. Probably not your neurologist. But uh, like a, there's usually an academic pain center nearby and they'll have some experience preparing these. So what's the evidence for this? The truth is there isn't a lot, you know, with a few exceptions. There was a really bad review that came out about triple cream, uh, amitriptyline, gabapentin, ketoprofen or something. And, um, you know, the triple cream was commonly used in pain centers. And then they actually said, well, I actually don't think it's doing a lot. And so that didn't seem to be particularly good, but we still have a, those few handful of patients that had such excellent success that it still lives on in a lot of pain people's memory. Um, a few agents have reached probably, you know, a sufficient level of evidence to support uh, systematic use. Um, and capsaicin is one of them, ketoprofen is another. So this was a, a good study looking at, uh, well, again, small actually, 42 patients with a history of episodic migraine. Again, double blind crossover placebo controlled study. Um, and they applied ketoprofen uh, bilaterally to the face. And this is in V1, V2, and V3, the distributions of trigeminal nerve for severe headache. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the 24 hour mark, probably 50% of the headaches treated with it had pain relief um, or were pain free versus 25% compared to placebo. And this was thought to be statistically significant. Um, the problem with this one is that it does cause some irritation at the application site. It's usually mild to moderate and it would go away quickly after applying it. But, you know, sometimes the treatment is worse than the cure. Like you don't want to come out of a migraine with a giant flaky red face. So, um, you know, still I'm, I'm not quite convinced that this is, you know, my preferred method of treatment. Um, but again, you know, I often see people who have tried, uh, you know, 20 different drugs or something and they need to try something else. And so this might be something to try. Um, capsaicin. So we briefly touched on it before, but if you see this picture in the top right, that's the receptor. And it can be activated by all sorts of things. The chili pepper extract, nerve growth factor, acidic uh, stuff, heat, and ethanol. But that makes sense. Like acid and, heat and uh, alcohol, like you've all felt it burn, you know, and, and that's kind of it activating that same receptor. Um, so... Very interesting active component in chili peppers. Um, and, you know, normally it's activated by physical heat, but capsaicin also can do this. And uh, so what's fascinating is that this receptor is really important for pain processing. And so it, it depolarizes the neuron, which means it sends a little electrical signal. Um, and it's important for pain processing, sending pain signals back uh, to the, the brain for processing. And it releases something called substance P, which is an important chemical messenger in pain. But what's really interesting is that if you continue to stimulate it, you know, you get something called tachyphylaxis. You run out of the messenger. So you run out of that substance P. 
And so by depleting substance P and also CGRP, which you know from migraine studies, um, you know, eventually it's like you've used up all your pain for that time and you got a refractory period. So you're left with kind of like a pleasant tingling numbness, you know. And so for some people, it's worth it to kind of concentrate all their pain at once and, and try, try this approach. So there was a systematic review of topical capsaicin for different chronic pain conditions. Um, and the ones I want to highlight in particular, post herpetic neuralgia, diabetic neuropathy, you'll see all the abbreviations in the bottom right here, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but it's used for a lot of different things. People use it for itchiness, they just like, I don't know why I'm itchy. You know, you've tried everything, you saw the dermatologist, they tried this. Psoriasis, sometimes they will try. Uh, I've seen a lot of post-incisional site for mastectomy that they've had success with capsaicin. Um, and different bladder disorders. So, I mean, people have tried it for a lot of different conditions. It seems to have minimal adverse uh, drug events. So local burning, stinging, redness, systemic events are pretty rare. Like having an anaphylaxis or something is pretty uncommon. Um, but if you inhale it you know, into your lungs, you can cause bad lung irritation, which is not great. Uh, you wanna keep it clear of mucous membranes because it can be quite painful. So looking specifically uh, at this one, in neuropathic pain conditions, the number needed to treat at eight weeks, so you're following them for a course of eight weeks with capsaicin, was about 0.075%, uh, it was 5.7. So for every six patients, what that means is that one would achieve at least 50% reduction in their pain, who would not have done so otherwise. Like if they were just taking a normal cream, um, like one in six will have the benefit of 50% pain reduction. Um, and, you know, maybe that sounds impressive or not, but for people that have been struggling with horrible, debilitating chronic pain, and they've tried everything else, you know, I still think those are pretty good numbers. So the one that really kind of made me blink and do a double take was uh, intranasal capsaicin. Like, you have to be pretty desperate to snort capsaicin, to be honest. Um, that is excruciatingly painful and will actually cause a lot of the autonomic symptoms that, that you're getting with a cluster headache. Um, but for the most ultimate refractory cases, perhaps it could be tried for migraine or cluster headache. I, I personally, I do not recommend this at all. Like it is the worst kind of pain. Uh, the studies are small, the effects are small. I mean, it makes sense to me based on the physiology of how we understand how this molecule works, but. I think the trick is we need to develop a version of it that doesn't result in more pain than it's treating. So summary of the topicals. We really need better trials before routine recommendations can be made. Uh, menthol has some decent evidence to support its use as an abortive. So you could try things like stop pain or the sage roller. Chamomile, I think, holds some promise as a topical, but we need better studies to, to look at it further. Lavender, I think, maybe warrants some more study, but uh, you know, maybe rose oil, not so much. And with that, I want to abruptly thank you for your rapt attention. And I want to turn the time to some questions. 